And that then gets taken and backed up by the verses that we read about in the early chapters of the Acts about Pentecost and uh, the experience of tongues of fire, um, some of the miraculous gifts, and then on from that, verses like Ephesians 5 and 18 about be filled with the Spirit. And so it goes from there. Well, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 comes in, and God says to us, by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And that, that's an element of help in this. And the baptism of Matthew 3 and 11, that's the promise of it. And 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 is an element of the fulfillment of it. And that early New Testament period is characterized by special activity by the Spirit of God. And one of the other topics that's on the list is kind of linked to this. And we might see that the days of those gifts appear to have passed. Now, that's not to say that God can't do miraculous things, amazing things, on an individual level today or in a church, but it appears that God wanted at the start of that New Testament period to express very clearly to unbelieving Jews, Gentiles, and at the start of that ministry period, a demonstration of God's work and God's Spirit. And it's in keeping with a lot of Old Testament experience that God's miraculous interventions in a very visual way, were relatively few. And a lot of the record is people living by faith. And occasionally there would be fire. And you think of the example of Elijah. But these things generally are that God wants us to live by faith and not by sight. And so we accept that just as God did not give the Spirit by measure to the Lord Jesus Christ. And his experience of the Holy Spirit, of course, is, could be quite different from ours. John 3 and 34, that God did not give, and it, whether it's to him exclusively, or him and us, or us, we don't exactly know, but it says there, that God did not give the Spirit by measure. So there's an idea, at least, that in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, and perhaps us too, the Spirit was not given by measure. And I think we've got enough to go on there with all the other things that you could say about second blessing, to say that we are given the Holy Spirit. And when Paul said to those in Ephesus, be filled with the Spirit, that was for them to awake to what they had already been given and to walk in the reality of what was already dwelling inside of them. Um, one of the, you pick up various expressions as you go through Christian life and there's, uh, let's call her a sturdy sister in Greenock and she was talking one day about a young person's life that they didn't seem to be showing an awful lot of uh, Christian living about them. And she says, aye, what they need is the touch of God. Uh, it was Simon's auntie, and it will probably be no surprise that she said that. And I think that can be a thing of itself, that we can have the Holy Spirit within us, but we can have an identifiable time when circumstances mean that we become more switched on to the reality and the presence of God. And so in that, we may be looking for a blessing. And that may be where you or I are today. That we feel 
that we're trudging or we're sliding back or we're going nowhere. And what we need is a touch of God through the Holy Spirit to give us direction in our life. And that kind of blessing, that's what we need. Not a second blessing, but that's the kind of blessing that we need. The possibility that if we turn away from God after we're saved, that we might no longer be among those that are saved, that we might have lost our salvation or we've fallen away from the salvation that we have. That One of the texts that is used for that is from the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> and chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. <clears throat> it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. And it is quite chilling to read that and think about the possibility that some people would believe that if you're saved and you reject God, you can be lost again. And that is a very, very alarming idea. And you know, that might be why this teaching has come about because people, in wanting to make sure that folks stay on the Christian pathway, that disciples continue to follow, that as a motivation for that, they say that if you go back, then you will lose your salvation. So in trying to motivate them to continue, they introduce an idea that is not there as we understand it in God's Word. Because if you take that to its natural extent, I think the chances are that you're then thrown back upon a doctrine of being saved by works or being saved by continuing. And it's the by continuing thing that determines that you were saved in the first place. And that's the very thing that God has freed us from, as we would understand it under the new covenant. That we trust in Christ, who has saved us once and for all. Now, you'll notice that the overall context of the book of Hebrews is of service. And we've heard that already. That it's of service primarily to God. And of course, it refers to salvation as we go through. How could it not? because that's where we've been taken from. But the overall impression of the book is of service. And the thing that you're reading about here, verse 7, the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and it bears herbs, but if it bears thorns and briars. So the idea there is of uh, bearing, of fruit bearing perhaps, of evidence of the work of God. Now, it may be that we walk away from God so far that there is no place of repentance in terms of service because of the attitude of heart, of mind, of lifestyle. 
And verse 9 to me is a help in this. Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. And to me, it's helpful that it says accompany salvation. So it seems as though he must have been speaking about things that accompany salvation. And he wasn't saying, the writer, that you could lose your eternal life. And again, we're thrown back on the idea that it's a risk that we take verses in isolation. Because there are other verses that seem very definitive in saying that once we're saved, we're saved for eternity. And we'll go quite quickly through uh, some of those. I wouldn't like to live my Christian life in fear that on any given day that I could be lost. And you would have no peace because there are some days, and it may be different for you, but there are some days when you don't feel very much like a disciple. And you've not done many things for God that day. You've not reaffirmed the fact in yourself that you're saved. And so, if you believe in the falling away doctrine, you may be saved on Monday, but lost on Tuesday, and saved again on Wednesday. And I don't want to parody it or laugh at it, but that's the reality of what you could believe. God tells us in Ephesians 1 that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How good a seal was that if it can be broken? Is that like a seal and a milk carton that can just be torn off and thrown away? I don't think so. I don't think God's word sustains that. That the seal of the Holy Spirit is an immense thing. And not only that, but we lay aside, and this is com trying to compare spiritual things with spiritual, that when the Lord Jesus promised to the disciples the Holy Spirit, he says, he'll be with you forever. So we take these two things and lay them side by side. And then you lay alongside that, that if you have not the Spirit of God, then you're not His. But if you have the Spirit of Christ, then you're His. So the seal, and forever, and having it. And if you have these things, then you're saved. Jesus said that if you believed in Him, you've passed out of death into life. So, you're saved and you're into life. But you've stopped believing and you've walked away. Have you passed back to death again? To those that believe, he gave the right to become children of God. And it says in John 3 about being born again. So you've been born again, but then you've walked away. And does that mean that spiritually you've died in that new spiritual life? Well, God says that in that new spiritual life that we've been given, on that side we cannot sin. And the wages of sin is death. So if we cannot sin on that side, how can we become a child of God and then be murdered by our own unfaithfulness and lost? So to me, the difference is that there's a difference between a loss of service and a loss of eternal life. And there are so many verses of assurance. John 10 and 28 of being held pictorially in God's hand and that none can snatch us out of that. Of Romans 8, 
that neither height nor depth nor breadth nor length nor anything in heaven above or earth beneath can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ.